Congress has recessed for the Independence Day holiday, but before leaving, the Senate took a moment to set aside its work on various bills for West Virginia Senator Robert Byrd. He spoke about why this day is significant to us. His comments from the Senate floor last about 40 minutes. It seems like such a short time ago that we rang in the new year. It is almost July. And the midpoint of the year has passed. How quickly we have gone from gray skies, lowering clouds, and seemingly incessant rain with some snow, some hail, strong winds to bright sunshine, and the first fruits and vegetables of the season. Already the brief moment of the wild strawberries those tender morsels of condensed sunshine and spring showers has passed. But juicy blackberries are ripening along their protective bramble arches, ready for picking in time to fill a pie that may grace a festive Fourth of July picnic table. In West Virginia, Whole families can be spotted. <coughs> Buckets in hand. Along the fence rows where brambles grow, especially those old rail fences. Gathering blackberries for pies and jam. Of course, the younger the picker, <coughs> the younger the picker, the more blackberries that end up inside the picker rather than inside the bucket. But that is just one of the messy, finger-staining joys of summertime. And the fingers are stained, as are the lips and the chins and the drippings on the clothing. When I think of the 4th of July, visions of family picnics, crowned by the very literal fruits of that very picking labor, are among the many happy thoughts that surface and like that blackberry pie, topped, of course, with melting vanilla ice cream, Fourth of July memories are a sweet blend of small town parades with volunteer firemen in brightly polished trucks and high school marching bands bedecked in their finest regalia of local beauty queens sharing convertibles with waving mayors and congressmen, senators, and flags. Flags everywhere. Flags everywhere. Waving in the sweaty palms of excited youngsters and proudly flying before houses on quiet side streets where no parade will ever pass, but where Grandpa might sit on the porch in his World War II service cap and wave to the passing neighbors. Aha, uh -huh, that's the American scene. Although cheapened by holiday sales, that commercialized the occasion, like all holidays, the 4th of July has somehow remained triumphantly above it all. Like the flag so gallantly flying over Fort McHenry, 
for Fort McHenry that, expired, that inspired Francis Scott Key to write the Star Spangled Banner. More families and friends gather for picnics or reunions and an evening spent watching fireworks than spend the day in the mall and the evening before the television set. Most people still know that the 4th of July celebrates the declaration of our nation's independence from Great Britain. Through other historical facts concerning our battle for freedom and the establishment of our government, though these other facts are fuzzy and out of focus, but not the 4th of July. Most people consider themselves patriotic though I suspect that a substantial percentage could not clearly define what it means to be a patriot. To be a patriot is much, much more than to be a fan of, say, a football team. To root for one's country is part of being a patriot. But that support can be shallow, like the hurrah of a sports fan that turns all too quickly to boos, B-O-O-S, when the team's record loses a certain winning luster. Those cheers, those hurrahs change to boos, B-O-O-S. There might have been some other spelling of boos imbibed in during the game, <coughs> but we'll leave that for another day. To be a patriot is to reach into the deep current that has carried our nation through history and not be distracted by the ephemeral eddies of scandal that ripple the surface. surface. <coughs> To be certain, a part of that definition is the quiet willingness to set aside one's own plans and don the uniform of a nation that calls for your service. But one need not wear a uniform to be a patriot, nor is it enough simply to pay your taxes or to obey the speed limit or to memorize the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, not the democracy, to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God. I'm uh, proud of the fact that I was a member of the other body and I'm the only member of Congress who still serves in the Congress of the United States, who was present there when the words under God were included in the Pledge of Allegiance. On um, June 7, 1954, and interestingly, interestingly, exactly one year from that day, on June 7, 1955, the House of Representatives, I was a member of the House at that time, the House of Representatives enacted legislation providing for these words, in God we trust to appear on the currency and the coin of the United States. Those words had appeared on some of the coin previous at that time. But on June 7, 1955, Congress, the House, one House of Congress, enacted legislation providing that the currency and the coin, the currency and the coin,
carried the words, in God we trust. Incidentally, this particular bill that I have, someone has written on it. Which I think is uh, against the law to deface this bill. I want to make a public confession now that it was not I who did that. And it was, uh, I won't read what it says, but it, it's uh, political in nature and uh, very partisan. But it's still $20, and it'll, I, I, I'll use it for a haircut, maybe, today. Well, all that aside from the subject matter of our remarks. So, to be a patriot involves understanding, appreciating, and protecting that which gives our nation its unique spot on the compass of the world, our Constitution. That's been much in the news the last 24, 36 hours. And that cannot be condensed on a bumper, onto, a bumper onto a bumper sticker. In establishing a government that adroitly balances the minority against the majority, the small or less populous states against the larger, the executive against the legislative, the legislative against the executive, the judicial against the legislative, and so on. And that preserves individual liberty and opportunity, our founding fathers truly delivered on the promise embodied in the 4th of July. The Declaration of Independence was a clarion call in the wilderness, a defiant shout down the echoing canyons of history saying, we can do better. The Constitution gave that call that was issued in the direct Declaration of Independence, gave that call, substance, and the more than 200 years of history since that time have done little to erode the triumph of that achievement. The Constitution of the United States of America is a remarkably compact document. Now, when one contemplates, this is it. This little tiny document. Of course, this particular booklet contains also the Declaration of Independence. But that's it. That's the Constitution of the United States. And think of the struggles. Think of the sacrifices of men and women. Think of the battles. Think of April the 19th, when Captain Parker stood on the green at Lexington with his men and bared their breasts to the British redcoats. And then at Concord, and then Bunker Hill, Think of those battles, King's Mountain, and think of the battles of the War of 1812, on the seas, on the land, and those, the carnage, the blood that was shed in the Civil War by men on both sides who fought for the Union, who fought against the Union. All of these and more gave their lives. And the Constitution still lives. They sacrificed. And the men who wrote the Constitution 
the men who wrote the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson, Franklin, Sherman, Adams, Livingston. Their lives were at risk. Their lives were at risk. They would have been hanged. That was treason. Treason to write that Declaration of Independence. They could have been taken to England and tried there. That was treason. Think of the sacrifices that have gone into the creation of that little booklet. The history the events, the treasures that were at risk, the fortunes that were lost, the lives that were lost, the blood that was shed, the families that were destroyed, the properties that were confiscated, all of these and more. And what did we get out of it? We got that, the Constitution of the United States. There are volumes of history. And the, the Constitution's beginnings went back, back for years, for decades, for centuries, back a thousand years. American constitutionalism began at Runnymede on the banks of the Thames on June 15, 1215. Went back to the English struggle where Englishmen shed their blood at the point of the sword in their efforts to wrest from tyrannical monarchs the power of the purse. So there it is. That's all we got out of it. But what that contains, more than the Magna Carta, and that's what we're celebrating on the day after tomorrow, a Declaration of Independence. Too soon we have forgotten, haven't we? This is a, this is a remarkable document. Every school child ought to study it. And every school child ought to be required to memorize it. The law of the Twelve Tables was created in Rome in the year 450 B.C. The delegation was sent to Athens to study the laws of Solon, that remarkable man who was one of the seven wise men of Greece, to study the laws and to bring back to Rome these ideas and the provisions that could be put into a law which the plebeians could understand as well as the, the patricians. And they, they went in 454, 454 BC and, came, and then they came back and began this work on, in 451 BC and in 450, they completed the work on the law of the 12 tables they inscribed these laws on tables. And uh, those tables were destroyed in the year 390 B.C. by Brennus and the Gauls. They conquered Rome and destroyed much of it and destroyed the law of the Twelve Tables in 390 B.C. But so what? Cicero, Cicero said, 
that the young people had been required to memorize the law of the Twelve Tables. And therefore, even though the Gauls destroyed the Twelve Tables, the law of the Twelve Tables lived on in the memories of the school children. And so they hadn't lost the law of the Twelve Tables. School children had been required to memorize the law of the Twelve Tables. Cicero also has this to say about the Constitution. He says, It is necessary that a senator be thoroughly acquainted with the Constitution, without which no senator can possibly be fit for his office. That's Cicero. And those who wish to find that quotation may look in Blackstone, in the first book of Blackstone, chapter Chapter 1, uh, paragraph uh, 10, I believe it is, of uh, section 1, I believe it is. But in Blackstone, Blackstone quotes Cicero and what Cicero said about the Constitution. So that's it. Let us all think about it on this fourth. Let us think about those who pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. For that, not much. What does it weigh? Put it on the scales. But on the scales of time, on the scales of history, on the scales of liberty, its weight cannot be measured. Every school child ought to study this, and every adult ought to know so instinctively that any challenge to the balance of powers outlined in this book, it happens to be a book here, in this document, is instantly identified and resisted. If only cultural antibodies could be developed that would allow the people of this nation to acquire an Im immunity and would allow the members of this body and the other body of the Congress today and forevermore to acquire an immunity to constitutional cancer, it is a vaccine that I would glad to take. Then perhaps I and others like me would not have to struggle so hard to excise the melanomas of balanced budget amendments and line item veto acts that periodically threaten to overturn the safeguards established by the framers to ensure that the people and their elected representatives have recourse against an ambitious power grab by the executive. Or by any political party. Like the wild strawberries and blackberries that sweeten a country stroll on a Sunday afternoon, our Republican form of government is a natural treasure of a generous and bountiful land. But like the delicate wild beauties of vine and bramble bush, which are too easily overlooked amid the garish profusion of plenty that surrounds us, so must we be alert to often subtle presence of constitutional safeguards embodied in our complex profusion of laws and governmental structures. 
Mr. President, we must guard against a complacency that would trample them underfoot or mow them down in a fervor of thoughtless modernization for the sake of change or in the name of some soulless efficiency. The 4th of July. This 4th of July, let us put aside for a moment the bright display of fireworks, the inspiring ring of martial music, and listen for the timeless song of our past. Listen for the courage and determination in the solemn opening paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, where it is said, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Mr. President, on July 4, 1776, the 13 United States of America committed themselves to a bold new course at great risk. It is no small thing to break away from centuries of tradition in the face of overwhelming military right, military might, and the opening paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence make it clear that our founding fathers knew full well the seriousness, the risks of the course they had embarked upon. They recognized the challenge laid out for them in establishing a new and better form of government. This 4th of July, I will happily watch the parades and the fireworks and with luck perhaps enjoy with my wife of 61 years and my daughters of many years and my grandchildren of several years, a piece of blackberry pie with ice cream. Make it vanilla, please. But I will also take the time to pull out my little copy of the Constitution that I carry with me near to my heart. I'll take a few minutes to marvel again at the skill and the economy Mark that word, the economy with which the framers outlined a government that has so well provided for our nation through the centuries. We who enjoy the freedom, the independence, the security, the liberty, and the prosperity of 1998 owe a great debt of gratitude for the courage and the commitment of those patriots of 1776, and an equal debt to the men, some of them the same individuals who followed through on that promise in the Constitutional Convention of 1789. 
1787. We honor them best, I think, by preserving their legacy for the patriots of the 21st century, our children and our grandchildren. The legacy bequeathed to us in trust for our children and grandchildren is, Mr. President, I say to the very distinguished patriotic senator who is from Wyoming and who graces the presiding officer's chair in this chamber today, I say, Mr. President, simply the most richly endowed nation on the face of the earth. This le legacy had been bequeathed to us in trust for our children and grandchildren. And it is simply the most richly endowed nation on the face of the earth. Rich in land, in opportunity, in liberty. We are the inheritors of plenty. Thank God. Merciful providence. I have had the great fortune to travel widely during my life. I have visited with kings and queens, shahs and prime ministers, princes and princesses and presidents, and premiers of many lands. I've seen the beauties of Europe, the mysteries of Asia and the Orient, the crumbling ruins of once mighty empires in the Middle East. They have all left me with wonderful memories and great stories. But when I travel, I pine for home. I took, took a trip around the world along with six colleagues in the House of Representatives in 1955. That was 43 years ago. We traveled around the world in an old constellation. We traveled for 68 days. That would have been called a junket today. We were a subcommittee of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. And so I traveled in many wonderful lands. But the most beautiful sight that I saw in that entire 68 days, having seen the Taj Mahal, having seen Sun Moon Lake on Taiwan, having seen the other wonders and beauties of the world and of nature, the most inspiring and gratifying thing that I saw were the two little bright red lights flashing at the top of the Washington Monument when we returned to the good old United States of America. We'd been in lands where there was no fresh, clean water to be drawn from the faucet. We so much take America for granted today. But what a wonderful experience it was anew to be able to go back to a faucet upon our return and see come from that faucet water, clear, pure, good water that we could drink without fear of becoming ill. So I've been left with many wonderful memories, but never shall I forget those two red lights at the top of the monument to the greatest president of the greatest country in the world, the Washington Monument. I miss when I travel the comforting presence of friendly West Virginia faces, 
the soft breeze that carries their cheerful hellos, the warm smiles that brighten the day and lift my heart. I think that I never appreciate home so much as when I am away from it. I suspect that, uh, Mr. President, you and most Americans feel that way too. Well, that great poet, Henry Van Dyke, certainly did. And he used his facility with words to capture the feeling that I've tried to express in his poem. America for me. Tis fine to see the old world and to travel up and down. Among the stately palaces and the cities of renown. To see the crumbly castles and the statues of the kings, but now I think I've had enough of antiquated things. So it's home again. It's home again. America for me. My heart is turning home again. There's where I long to be in the land of youth and freedom beyond the ocean bars where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars. Oh, England is a man's town. There's power in the air. And Paris is a woman's town with flowers in her hair. But it's great to study Venice and it's good to be in Rome. But when it comes to living, there's just no place like home. I've seen the German fir woods and green battalions drilled. I've seen the Garden of Versailles with flashing fountains filled. But just to take your hand, my dear, and travel for a day in friendly West Virginia hills where nature has her way. I know that Europe's wonderful, yet something seems to lack. The past is too much with her, and her people looking back for the glory of the present is to make the future free. We love our land for what she is and what she is to be, so it's home again. It's home again. America for me. I want a ship that's westward bound to plow the rolling sea to the blessed land of room enough beyond the ocean bars where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars. Fred, now you In a moment, we'll continue our Independence Day programming with Vice President Al Gore. He'll offer